thank you for listening to the History of World War II podcast, Episode 213, The Second Sino-Japanese War, The Fall of Wuhan. Last time, with Shanghai occupied and the former capital Nanjing equally lost, with hundreds of thousands of Chinese being slaughtered, Chiang Kai-shek, the nationalist leader, met with his generals and focused on protecting his new military headquarters at Wuhan. But in reality, as there was a lack of transportation, much of his civilian government could not get further west to Chongqing. Hence, Wuhan became the de facto capital. Problem was, there was a rail line that connected Wuhan to Shuzhou to the northeast, and the Japanese were already preparing to take that city. Cheng's generals asked themselves, and each other, could Wuhan resist the Japanese? No one knew the answer, of course, but the officers did agree that it was important to keep their leader from micromanaging its defense. The late January meeting ended with hope, laced with pessimistic reality. As things now stood, the Japanese controlled Shanghai and Nanjing, the latter being only some 250 kilometers or 155 miles southeast of Shuzhou in the form of the Central China Area Army, or CCAA. Also, as Shandong along the coast to the north had fallen, covered last time, another Japanese army was roughly the same distance to the northeast of Shuzhou, this being the forces of General Shishiro Itakaki, the chief of staff of the Kwangtung Army, and his Imperial Japanese Army, 5th Division. Thus, the way forward for them seemed obvious. The two forces would come together at Shuzhou and then drive south to finish off Chang's government. Leaving Nanjing, the CCAA drove to the northwest. First, it took Zhang Ziang about 40 kilometers away. Though Wuhan was roughly due west of Nanjing, the Japanese forces headed northwest to reach the Jimpu rail line that would lead them to Wuhan. It would also make sure they could resupply their troops while denying this to the Chinese. Continuing to push to the northwest, the forces of the CCAA then reached and took Mingguo, another 70 kilometers or 43 and a half miles distant. This was on January 15th. As the Japanese had been pushing to the northwest, they ran into one defensive line after another. True, the Chinese did not have the tanks or planes they needed to hold back the enemy. Still, this fighting took time and cost the Japanese lives. So after Mingguo, the CCAA split into three prongs. This would deny the defenders from amassing their superior numbers and keep the march to the rail line in motion. One of the columns would get through. Sure enough, the Chinese... Though fighting harder, the deeper the penetration of the enemy, all three columns captured target towns and crossed rivers, locations the Chinese hoped to use as defensive points. The larger city of Bangbu, 30 kilometers west of Mingguo, was taken on February 2nd. Getting desperate, General Li Zogren, the defensive commander in the area, managed to keep some of his troops in front of the Japanese while organizing retreats of other forces to the north and west. And this slowed the attacking forces. Several times, rivers were crossed by the Japanese, only to be pushed back. In one case, three times. Slowly but steadily, the invaders made progress, but lost lives along the way. By the middle of February, the Japanese were exhausted and stopped to await additional supplies and to deal with their wounded. They had reached the Hua River and were only some 75 kilometers or 46 and a half miles south of Suzhou, but they had been stopped. For now. Meanwhile, to the north, the Japanese there were trying to follow the west to east rail line of the Long Hai Railway that would also take them to Suzhou. As they already controlled the capital of the Shandong province, Jinan, this should have been a relatively easy push to the south and southwest, but their overconfidence resulted in the attackers not pursuing their course prudently. 
just south of Jinan, the Itagaki Division, 5th Division, named after Shishiro Itagaki, ran into stiff resistance right away at Linyi, and there they were stalled. Other Japanese columns were also stymied to the east of Linyi along the coast. Of all the various forces trying to push along the Chinese railway in the north, the Asogai Division, or 10th Division, was the most successful. Still, their way wasn't easy either. Heading south out of the recently captured Jinan, the 10th covered 40 kilometers, or 25 miles, where they reached Tai'an. Chinese commanders Sun Tongzhan and Sun Zhen knew they didn't have the tanks, planes, or large guns to stop the Japanese. All they had were men, so used them as best they could. Starting at Tai'an, the Chinese troops were formed into one line behind another. So when the Japanese broke through, they were immediately met by more resistance. To be sure, the next line would be breached as well. But this took time and cost Japanese lives. It cost the Chinese even more lives, but the war of attrition had begun. This went on until mid-March, but the 10th could only manage to drive south, reaching Yizan, 240 kilometers south of Jinan, never able quite to turn to the southwest. Another part of the pincer plan had failed. Besides waging a war of attrition, the Chinese plan was to delay the enemy in everything they wanted to do. So by mid-March, two other Chinese commanders had reached the area penetrated the furthest by the 10th, and they brought with them the equivalent of seven more divisions. Still, as impressive as the sounds, if the Japanese brought their various forces together, along with their superior weaponry, it would have ended in another slaughter. This is what the Chinese sought to avoid, letting the enemy bring their troops together. Ironically, the Japanese did it for them. As Isogai's 10th Division was the furthest south and west of the Japanese North China Army, he was supposed to wait for the other units before taking the next step, i.e. occupying Tire Zhuang, itself located in the southern part of the Shandong province, halfway between Jinan and Nanjing, and only 50 kilometers, or 31 miles, northeast of Shuzhou itself. But that's not what Isogai wanted to do, nor would the nationalist commander Tong Embo, with his four fresh, fully-strength divisions, allow him. Technically, 5th War Area Leader Lin Zonggrin put someone else in charge of defending Tai Zhuang, but Tong, as soon as he arrived, began harassing the enemy. As Isogai's 10th Division was just north of Tao Zhuang, Tang sent a relatively small force to engage the enemy and draw them into the city, where the rest of Tang's men were waiting. Isogai took the bait and sent 40,000 men south. As they were supported by 80 tanks and aircraft, Isogai believed they were on the verge of another victory. The Japanese force moved out on March 21st. That same day, Japanese bombers began attacking the city itself to soften it up. Two days later, on March 23rd, Japanese artillery joined in on the harassment. The civilians of Tai Zhuang fled as their homes and the buildings fell around them. This was a gamble on Tong's part, risking his fully supplied forces, and besides, he was not in overall command. So, on the 24th, Chiang Kai-shek himself flew in to assess the situation. The nationalist leader, though nervous about losing another seven divisions, if this did not go well, liked Tong's boldness and told him to continue, but made it clear this had better work. As the two sides clashed, both fed men into the fray, a disaster of a move for the Japanese, if progress wasn't made. Numerous Chinese soldiers removed their uniforms dressed as farmers, and spread out behind the Japanese, and begun cutting communication lines, diverting streams to make the enemy's maps inaccurate, and sabotaged the rail lines, being used by the Japanese. Soon, in a reverse of Shanghai, the attackers were having trouble getting supplies to the front, 
while the Chinese commanders went above and beyond to make sure their men stayed equipped. Soon, the Japanese Air Force, foreshadowing the Luftwaffe during Germany's titanic struggle with Russia, began dropping supplies to their comrades on the ground. But they could never deliver enough. Near the end of March, Japanese soldiers tunneled their way into Taizhuang, but were found out and ambushed by the defenders. Isogai began to receive reinforcements from one of the other forces, and the Japanese moved closer to the city from the north. The fighting grew in intensity as the men came face to face. Both sides started losing men at an even faster rate, but the Chinese had more to spare. Soon the fighting was along the streets of the city, but neither side slackened. This went on for a few days, and some Chinese soldiers would strap grenades to themselves and then run under a Japanese tank or dive at a group of enemy troops, causing vastly uneven casualties. By April 7th, the Japanese were exhausted, as were the Chinese, but they had more men to throw at the enemy, and that is exactly what Tong did. On that day, estimating his losses at 8,000 men, the Japanese general pulled back his attack. The Chinese had won their first major victory. It seemed that the men of the rising sun were not invincible. When word of this victory exploded over unoccupied China, the celebrations were at a fever pitch. The Japanese denied any such event, yet Tokyo had to admit to the foreign press that Suzhou much less Wuhan, was still not in their possession. U.S. Ambassador Nelson Johnson wrote to Secretary of State Cordo Hall from Wuhan and said that, with this victory and what damage the Chinese communists were achieving with their guerrilla tactics, the Japanese had realized subduing the whole of China would take much more time. And men. The British had a more subdued reaction to the victory. Britain's ambassador to China, Sir Archibald Clark Kerr, wrote to British Foreign Secretary Lord Halifax, Chang has now become the symbol of Chinese unity, which he himself has so far failed to achieve, but which the Japanese are well on the way to achieving for him. The days when Chinese people did not care who governed them have gone. My visit to central China from out of the gloom and depression of Shanghai has left me stimulated and more than disposed to believe that provided the financial end can be kept up, Chinese resistance may be so prolonged and effective that in the end, the Japanese effort may be frustrated. Chiang Kai-shek is obstinate and difficult to deal with. Nonetheless, the nationalists are making in their muddling way a good job of things in extremely difficult circumstances. And yet, the victorious glow of Tyre Zhang quickly burned away. For the Chinese, they were unable to push back on the Japanese forces nearby, as their logistical shortcomings were still in full force. Whereas the Japanese learned from their mistakes. Next time, the commanders would be prudent. They would work together and make for Shuzhou and encircle it but only after reinforcements were sent from North China. And in regards to commanders working together, nothing had changed in Chang's subordinates. They still did not trust each other, trust Chang, nor did they put China's needs ahead of their own fiefdoms. For instance, Li Zongren, the man Chang placed in charge, not only did not use his best troops, but he did what he could to make sure Tong and Bo's men took the brunt of the fighting, which forced Tong's men to continue to engage the Japanese north and east of the city throughout April. Here's a question for you. What would you do to save humanity? And how far would you go to stop someone who was getting in your way? The ancient rivalry of assassins and Templars cuts to the heart of good versus evil. But it wasn't always clear who was good and who was evil. Plug in to explore the amazing world of medieval feuds. Echoes of History, Assassins vs. Templars, is a special collaboration between History Hit and Ubisoft, the masterminds behind the Assassin's Creed games. 
Hosted by Dan Snow from History Hit and Matt Lewis from Gone Medieval, together they will take a close look at the real history of the secret societies, which inspired the Assassin's Brotherhood and the Templar Order in the Assassin's Creed games. Plus, they will bring on other premier historians as they discuss unearthing the myths of the Grail and who really was the inspiration for the main characters in the game. Echoes of History, Assassins vs. Templars podcast is available right now wherever you get your podcasts. Listen and subscribe to Echoes of History today to discover the hidden truths that have shaped our world and inspired the video game series. That's Echoes of History wherever you get your podcasts. Listen today and subscribe for more. Hey everyone, Ray here. Audible is offering my listeners a free audiobook with a 30-day trial membership. Just go to www.audible.com slash WWII and browse their unmatched selection of audio programs. Download a title for free and start listening. It's that easy. Again, go to www.audible.com slash WWII or text WWII to 500-500 to get started today. And trust me, as I have been myself an Audible member for years, I know you will not be disappointed. Why? Because Audible content includes an unmatched selection of audiobooks, original audio shows, news, comedy, and more from the leading audiobook publishers, broadcasters, entertainers, magazines, and newspaper publishers, and business information providers. You get book credits each month for a low monthly fee. Customers download their choices and can access them on their iPhone, Android device, Fire tablet, iPod, or other MP3 player. Again, easy. For example, most of my initial research starts with Audible as I evaluate a book while driving around or exercising. When you give Audible a try, make sure to check out one of these titles. Countdown to Pearl Harbor, The Twelve Days to the Attack by Steve Twomey, The Battle of Britain, Five Months That Change History, made October 1940 by James Holland, or The Rising Tide, a novel of World War II by Jeff Shara, which is the first of the series, and trust me, it will blow you away. And the best part of all this, you will own the book. It's yours forever. But if you try something and you don't like it, you can swap it. Can't get better than that. And you can share a book from your library with anyone And if it's their first time accepting a book through this feature, they can listen for free. So, there is no downside to trying out Audible's 30-day trial membership. But to support this show, please go to www.audible.com slash WWII or text WWII to 500-500 to get started today. That's www.audible.com slash WWII or text WII to 500-500. Thank you very much. To the south of Suzhou, the men defending against the CCAA were not as resilient as Tong's men. Though they had held up the enemy at the Huai River, some 75 kilometers, or 46 and a half miles south of Suzhou, the Japanese brought in their bombers and began reducing the defensive positions in front of them. By April, the CCAA was back on the move, heading north. Making for Suzhou proper, there were three divisions and the 1st and 2nd tank battalions, who each had motorized support units. These units were separated and organized into the Awanaka and Imada detachments and sent to the northwest, to the western edge of Shuzhou, to prevent any Chinese troops retreating that way when the city fell. Further, forces from the North China Area Army were sent south towards Suzhou to make sure Chinese forces further west did not come to the city's aid. As the Chinese could not tolerate this, General Chang Xiang's forces were sent to deal with Lieutenant General Katsuki of the Japanese First Army. The Japanese, however, had no trouble driving the defenders back, but this seemingly Japanese victory to the north would force Chiang Kai-shek into making one of the most controversial decisions of the entire war. 
Adding to Suzhou's woes, the Japanese controlled enough of China's railways to make sure the city did not receive any further reinforcements, as enemy forces were coming closer from several directions. Getting supplied had been one of the major reasons for the short-lived victory at Taizhuang. With Suzhou about to be encircled, Chang had no choice but to call for a withdrawal on May 15th. Just the day before, some 700 civilians had died as a result of Japanese bombing raids. True, Chang had some 600,000 troops around the city, but even these numbers could not stand up to the reinforced and now highly focused and motivated Japanese coming in. And just like that, the Battle of Suzhou was over before it truly got underway. This was mostly due to the proximity of the CCAA coming from the south, as they were closer than the Japanese forces to the north. But alas, as the Japanese were too few, most of the city's defenders managed to escape to the west, though clashes did bring about Japanese casualties of some 30,000 and about 100,000 for the Chinese. The loss of Suzhou was another blow to the nationalist government and to Chiang Kai-shek personally, but his army had survived. The glow of Tai Zhuang was truly gone now. As that victory let the Japanese know this war would be long, the loss of Suzhou informed the Chinese of the same. Yet Mao Zedong, the communist leader, wasn't surprised. His speech at this time on protracted war, stated that China would eventually win, but it would take years, and victory would come only by bleeding the enemy to death, not financially as Chang sought to do, but literally. Of course, the pressure from the North did not let up, as those forces were expected to be a part of a pincer movement that would capture Wuhan and hopefully finish off the Chinese government. The Japanese North China Army continued to spread west, which opened up a way south to Wuhan. On June 7, 1938, the Japanese took the city of Kaifeng, 450 kilometers or 270 miles, due north of Wuhan. Directly after this, a U.S. embassy worker wrote to Washington, The second phase of the Long Hai campaign is nearing a close. A direct campaign for the capture of Hong Kao, which most Westerners called Wuhan, will ensue. Not unexpectedly, the Japanese were staying close to the railways, seeking to control them and the areas around them. This is what allowed them to move relatively fast and with tens of thousands of troops. But before the North China Army could turn south to make for Wuhan, they needed to occupy the city of Jiangzhou, just 40 kilometers west of Kaifeng. There, the two major rail lines met, which meant, if the enemy controlled it, not only would Wuhan be open, but large cities to its northwest, the likely places Chang would retreat to next, would also be vulnerable. This seemed to be the end game of the Second Sino-Japanese War. Here was Chang's latest and greatest gamble. If he defended Wuhan and lost, his army would be shattered, which was the goal of the Japanese. However, even if he just tried to hold out as long as possible, then his troops and government would not have enough time to retreat west to Chongqing, thus again ending the nationalist government. So, unlike Shanghai, Nanjing, and Shuzhou, Wuhan had to be held or abandoned right now. But that last option would probably mean the end of any serious Western assistance. By now, U.S. personnel in China was getting the measure of Chiang Kai-shek. One wrote home, if Wuhan was lost, and it probably would be, that even though this would mean the loss of staggering revenue and the loss of China's greatest industrial center, the nationalists would not give up. Chang would not give up. Japan may count this victory as the end of the war, but Chang would see it as just another tactical retreat. 
the nationalists may yet cause the Japanese to spend themselves into defeat. Thus, the stage was set for the Battle of Wuhan. Technically, the contest for Wuhan started back in February 18th, as the Japanese sent an air raid to the city. This was called the 218 Air Battle, and as Wuhan was the second largest city in China, it had massive ground and air forces. The Chinese were able to beat back the Japanese attack, but only due to superior numbers. Three weeks later, Tokyo, fully realizing what would be needed to conquer China, passed the National Mobilization Law, which authorized unlimited funding for the war. It also opened the way for the conscription of civilians. Back to the present, Chiang Kai-shek knew that Chiang Cho was the next Japanese target, but had no forces to stop them. The bulk of what he had, or had access to, was making for Wuhan to prepare for the coming battle. Unlike the Yangtze River to the south, the major waterway near Zhengzhou, the Yellow River, or Huanghe, a.k.a. China's Sorrow, was awash with low silt, giving it its name. The river made the land around it fertile, but over the centuries it would alter course and flood nearby towns and villages, killing thousands. Over time, the various Chinese governments built dikes, which kept the river within its bank. One such massive dike was near Zhengzhou, and going by it was the path the Japanese would have to use to take their next target city. Almost three years ago, the German advisor von Falkenhausen had told Chang to consider destroying it, the dike, as a last option. And as Chang Cho was about to be taken, thus opening the way to Wuhan, another general of the first war zone reminded the leader of this most drastic of options. The last major flood of the Yellow River back in 1887, had cost China almost one million lives. By the opening of June, Chiang Kai-shek had a day or two to make his decision. The chief of staff of the 8th Division informed Chiang that the Japanese were already on the north bank of the Yellow River. The only reason they had not crossed yet was that local forces had blown the railway bridge there. But the Japanese were already working on a remedy. Desperate, Chang gave the order to blow the dike. The nearby army moved to the town of Joku and tried to destroy the dike there on June 4th, but it did not give. They tried again, but the sturdy obstruction held. They tried again and again. Nothing gave. Two other dikes were considered, but the Japanese were already at one of those locations, so the dike at Hua Yang Ko, just north of Zhouzhen, where the river bent, it would have to be. The demolition crew spent the night of June 6th at the dike, sleeping in their car, to be ready for the next morning. But as the sun rose, the men began to ponder what they were about to do. Wu Han and the army would be saved for a while, but tens of thousands of Chinese, maybe more, would die. Chinese culture said that fate punishes people who do such things by not allowing them to have large families, people to take care of them when they're old. But the engineers told their men this was not their decision, so fate would not come down hard upon them. The 2,000-man work crew began working on the dike on the morning of June 8th, the Japanese were getting closer to crossing. Again, the men were getting nervous about their tasks, so the general on the scene had musicians sent in to play music. This did little for the men's spirits. Then the general said that if the dike gave way by midnight, each man would receive 2,000 yen. If it collapsed the next morning by 6 a.m., they would only get 1,000 yen. The men dug faster as they had no explosives. Those 2,000 men earned their 2,000 yen. By 1 p.m. of June 9th, the Yellow River was flowing like 10,000 horses to the southeast, across the plains, and in front of the Japanese troops. 
The diggers got away on boats, but hundreds of thousands of Chinese would not escape the flood. They had no idea it was coming. One report said 500,000 peasants were driven from 2,000 communities to await rescue or death on whatever dry ground they could find. Chiang Kai-shek understood the enormity of what he had done, so blamed it on the Japanese bombers. The Japanese denied this, of course, but after the massacre at Nanjing, few believed them. A month later, the truth came out. Later, nationalist reports estimated that between 500,000 and 844,000 people died, with between 3 and 5 million becoming refugees. But the Japanese were stopped from advancing by rail. Now that the way to the north was cut off for the Japanese, Tokyo planned to reach Wuhan by sailing up the Yangtze River. Obviously, this endeavor would require the assistance of the Imperial Japanese Navy, and some nine divisions would accompany it. Sailing past the ruined Nanjing, the flotilla traveled some 200 kilometers, or 124 miles, upriver to the southwest. There, the various Japanese forces attacked Mondong and other cities on both banks of the Yangtze. Between June 24th and the 27th, the cities were bombed and then invaded. The Chinese had no answer for the aerial attacks. After consolidating their gains, the Japanese moved on and took the abandoned city of Jujiang at the end of July. The civilians there were treated to the same murder and rape as Nanjing by the frustrated Japanese soldiers. Chang was frustrated as the men defending the way to Wuhan were not under his direct control, and again the local warlords looked after themselves and their men. The Generalissimo addressed all the troops by saying that they should strive to look after the people, who were, after all, China. But he ended by saying, if you do not show loyalty, none will be shown to you. This combination of appealing to their nationalism while threatening them seemed to have worked. The men and the generals fought harder, if still not cooperating with each other. Just north of the abandoned Zhujiang at Huangmi, 100,000 Chinese troops fought the invaders to a standstill. And the Japanese had a harder time of it the further west they went. Still, the Navy sailed on stopping off at key cities which were taken, but only after Chinese forces gave their all and cost the Japanese thousands of lives each time. It would have been imprudent to sail directly to Wuhan, where hundreds of thousands of Chinese soldiers waited, while leaving tens of thousands of the same behind them. The Japanese advanced, but this took time. August and September saw combat that had the Chinese fighting if imperfectly, at least to the death. Japan might take Wuhan, but the price would be high. By now, the floods to the north had subsided, which allowed the North China Army to come south. Wuhan, like Shuzhou before it, was caught in a vice. When Xinyang, just 120 kilometers, or 74 and a half miles, north of Wuhan fell, Cheng again addressed the soldiers of free China. Striking a balance of exhorting the men to fight to the death, he also made it clear that Wuhan's loss would not mean the end of the war. In fact, he gave the men, even those controlled by others, exact routes to take if they had to leave. And this speech seemed to be the death knell of Wuhan. Factories were again broken down and sent west to Chongqing. On October 24th, Chang told his generals, You must go first. I will leave soon after. By now, the Japanese were just outside the city. At 10 p.m. that night, Chang and his wife Mei Ling took off in a civilian plane. But instead of going west, the country's first couple flew south. 450 kilometers, or 275 miles, to Hongyang. The next day, October 25th, 1938, 
troops of the Japanese army entered the city. Now all eyes, Chinese, Japanese, and those of the West, turned to Chongqing. Would the Japanese head there next, or would they see the taking of Wuhan as the end of the war? The West was wondering the same thing, but hoped Chang would not see it that way. They would not be disappointed. Greetings from Central Virginia. So, don't forget to enter the contest for the World War II version of the Monopoly game. Just send an email to wwiipodcast at gmail.com and put Monopoly in the subject line. And good luck to everybody. I'll be uh, drawing that sometime in mid-February. As many of you know, um, I am now podcasting full-time. I have taken the leap of faith. So if you've ever thought about supporting this show in some way, uh, probably the best would be membership. Uh, For $5 a month, you get two extra episodes. Please consider that, and you can sign up on the uh, website, worldwar2podcast.net, and I'll send you the login information. So just please consider doing that. And um, I've got over 100 episodes, not quite 200. We've covered a lot of different subjects behind the scenes. Just about to finish up the Spanish Civil War, where the Condor Legion and the Italian Air Force was uh, really made a difference in Franco's um, victory in Spain. Uh, I've got a lot more things lined up that we'll be covering. Uh, so again, anything you can do to support the show would be greatly appreciated. Uh, review on iTunes, donation, sign up for membership, uh, buy a mug, anything like that. And you can find all the information on the uh, World War II website. So I will see you soon as I can with the next episode. I'm going to try to adjust my schedule so that um, every other episode has no ad in it at all. So that's the goal. So, uh, I'm still trying to work out the details for that. Um, so again, thanks for listening and I will see you as soon as I can with the next episode. And we, I'm trying to, as you can probably tell with this episode, I'm trying to get to the preamble of, uh, the tension that builds up between the United States and Japan that leads to Pearl Harbor. So I'm just trying to get through this, but I wanted to give it context, which is why we're covering the second Sino-Japanese war. And, uh, we'll be getting to Pearl Harbor just as soon as I can. Then we'll jump back to the Eastern front and then find a way to balance out the two, two wars, the two theaters at the same time. Take care, everyone. Growing a business brings pressure. It's not easy to maintain momentum and still keep employees engaged. Fortunately, there's Insperity. Their scalable HR solutions help me with hiring, training, HR administration, and compliance while giving my employees competitive benefit options. When my people are able to thrive, my business can adapt and prosper. With Insperity, nothing seems impossible. Insperity, HR that makes a difference.